David McCauley to gather the Technology Subcommittee meeting of August 7, 2024. Please call the roll. Mr. Here. Mr. Bailey. Ms. Flyerman. Here. Can we please uh, rise for salute to the Congratulations to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and the visible liberty and justice for all. Do you have any citizen input the Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present, and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. We'll jump right into the first item on the agenda is a discussion and vote to refer core business technology contracts. Okay. Madam Superintendent or your designee. So these were referred back just because the committee, the full committee had some questions on them. There are three different uh, contracts here. The first one is our overall yearly contract. The coverage dates are for the next three years. Um, this contract uh, includes all parts, labor, toner, and developer for all of our fleet and the desktop printers. Unlimited pages, includes paper, includes staples. Um, and it also includes something that we rolled out last year called Paper Cup, where um, if you're an end user in a district and you're in this building, you create a document and you decided to go to Derby, you could log into the printer at Derby and print your device there. So it's just something to make everyone's life a little easier. Um, it has gone up about $4,000 this year. Um, so that, that contract is $216,800. Um, and that brings us through um, 2026. Each year it will be the same amount and then our contract with CORE will be over because those next two contracts represent the only leases that we have left with CORE, um, that being Derby High School and the uh, Copy Production Center, um, where we have two large uh, Kinko FedEx style machines and a, and a large color um, machine as well as a large plotter. Um, I can say, just, just to give some other information, last year when we talk about having this plan um, they were on 573 service calls throughout the year for us, and of those 573, 321 were called in when school either opened or within the first two hours of the day, and were rectified day of within three to four hours. Um, I had worked with other um, copy machine companies in the past in, in former districts, um, and the turnaround time is just it's not there. Um, also, what is very uh, reassuring to us here in the Fall River Public Schools is um, they worked with us. Um, we had a machine go down in Talbot. Um, we didn't at the time have funding. This is years ago when I was a director. Um, they actually trucked in a loaner for us to use for the rest of the year for your charge. It was a larger machine. Um, so they've done some um, excellent work with us. At the end of these three years, again, this will, you know, this is state contract pricing, which does make it easier in procurement mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the uh, year contract here, um, we will go back out to bid and, and research and see what's out there. Because, again, you'll see in the technology plan, stuff is changing ever so quickly. In three years, I couldn't even begin to tell you what a copy machine is going to look like or cost. Any questions? No. Can you tell me what the, you said paper cut was part of this. What does that cost? Is that? Um, so paper cut last, when we purchased it initially, was about $29,000 and it included 90 licenses. So they're only for our large scale production machine. So a, a, a little desktop laser printer is not going to have paper cut on it. It's going to be going to a teacher room, going to a main office. You can go in, you can run a copy job, and you can pause the copy job, and then you can go to the third floor teacher's room and rerun it. Um, paper cut lives on the big production machines in the buildings. How many people have used it? Uh, I can pull numbers, but it's, it's, it's how everyone prints in the district. Um, so I can pull you some numbers. We get it in the Friday email or for the next committee. I just, uh, as you're talking about it, functionally, I don't understand. Yeah, I, I can pull numbers know, for because you. Because if I print something, I want to print it in my printer in my office. Like, I don't understand. So I, for the, the boots on the ground, I think that it does this make any sense to how often am I going to be at working at this school, print something, and then have to run to Durfee to print it? Like, I just don't, wouldn't so, you save it as a file 
in your computer anyway, and it, yeah, I, so I just don't know. The other, the other piece is Chromebook printing is not, we're in the world of Chromebooks with the kids, a lot of staff members have them as well. The other piece that PaperCut allows us to do is something called a universal print driver. So it installs onto this machine and it can be printed from any machine. So it, on the back end side, takes away the need for a large print server at the cost of 75 to 80 grand. It runs all the printers on the cloud. It also saves those um, print jobs. So you as a principal, if you had an IEP that you printed last month, you could go back into your history, pull back up that IEP, print it again. Um, it's a depository, um, and it's just something to make people. Yeah, just my. But I. You said it. I think it just begs more questions. Yeah. There's probably more to it than having well, a print from another school like your first I answer, see. because that to me is near thirty grand to to do. But maybe you can have some anecdotal evidence for that. Okay. Teachers or you know, see who uses it. And one of the reasons why I asked to hold this was because. I think we need to take a good look at what we do for copiers. Uh, you just mentioned that we purchased some, which I think is smart so that we're not paying leases, but as a committee member, I don't, I don't know whether it's a good deal or not. I don't know if the state bid list is a good deal or not. State bid list is just convenient more than anything, but I don't necessarily think it's the greatest deal automatically. And when I look at these, we're spending half a million dollars on copiers or whatever. The, we're spending good money. Um, my question would be to see what is it. Are we getting a good deal? Is it uh, are there needs that the principals' departments need that are not being met based on the current structure? And then if we could even look into uh, the color copies versus not what, what's the policy for color copies in the district? As of right price? now, there isn't one. But there's a color machine in each building that they need to print the color copy. They are allowed to. Um, and then all the sped uh, ASD rooms to the using uh, board maker software have them in the locations and they print. But I think we, it begs the, it, it's a lot more expensive to print. I know it's part of this contract, but if they're giving you cop launch to say we're going to give you all the toner and everything for color copies as part of this, then there's no reason to sacrifice and say just if, it, if it's free, just give it everything, you know. But if they're giving you that kind of thing to say we're going to pay for it all. That means that they're increasing the price, in my layman's opinion. The only, it's, for me, on, on my end, just technically, a color machine is going to cost more because of the finisher. The black and white machine is going to cost less. So typically, historically, we've always loaded the buildings because we didn't have that extra money. We put black and white machines in the schools. Um, over the past four or five years, through some different administrations and school committee, they've seen the need that we needed that color in the schools and we slowly been rolling out more and more color. Um, as a matter of fact, I have um, three more color units on order for the new Westall School. Um, so I can pull some of that information for you so that you can see. Um, and then uh, we will look at this as a senior staff um, as we near the end of the contract to um, send out a request for proposal. Um, the one last piece I will say on core is they use Rico Savin machines, which are um, very durable. We used some other machines in the past as far as Konica Minolta and Canon, and they are down uh, historically more times than they're able to be used by staff. Um, so we've had very good luck with the Rico Savin line. That's core. Yeah, I, I, think you're, I think you're on it. Just a, a, a close look at it as we go. We're locked into these couple of like, is this a new lease that we're going to do for three years, or is this just... This is a lock-in, it's just a renewal. It's just a renewal, so we couldn't cancel anyway if we wanted to? No. When we opened up the new building, these were the leases on the new building, and then this is the fleet charge that we do um, through the end of the lease, but it incorporates the whole district. So when you, when I'm looking here, it says uh, the first one, <clears throat> 216000 It said it starts July 1 of 2024. Does it show, was this... Correct. Right. I could pull out in July 2 of 2025 and not renew this contract, but then we would be responsible internally for all the machines that we own for toner, for supplies, for repairs. This is we're only um, this is only for the first year of the 216-800. Um, we could pull out in consequent years. However, we would be responsible for all of those devices, and I can tell you right now I don't have anyone on staff that would be able to take them apart the way that 
think we need to be. But where in it does it say we can get out? Um, I have, there's another contract. This was just, um, because we do so much business before, I mean, most of the time it's just a one sheet MOU, uh, and then they send the contract when they sign and fulfill the contract at the city level, which I can get once they supply it. <clears throat> it just looks like we're into 2027 on the second page. So. Yeah, that was just, that's again that's the MOU agreement because we still we are going to have all these machines um, and the one thing that I've been able to do with Mr. Uh, Almeida throughout the years is we've been able to put newer machines in the schools. There are a few schools that we will look to replace and purchase and not lease. Um, however, we are going to need a way to keep and maintain those that fleet. So right now that's uh, our plan. It's, it's complicated. It is. It's not simple, but. I appreciate you looking at it. So, can we get a motion to refer? Motion to refer. And second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So vote. Thank you. I just clarify, is that the three? Three, yeah. four. Okay. Next up is uh, discussion and vote to refer, updated technology plan. Okay, so we have not had an updated technology plan in quite some time. Um, now that I've had a full year, you know, year and a half under my belt as the CIO. I've uh, been able to take a look structurally at our department as well as the district as a whole. Um, the one thing that I do not like and we will not do further as a school district is strategically plan in the area of technology in five year segments. Um, technology is ever changing. You buy a cell phone, the cell phone changes, the next day you buy it. Um, so with this plan, this encompasses 24, 25 school year will be reviewed annually. Um, if the subcommittee refers it for a first read, we will then create a um, subcommittee of our own that will look at this and take a part as we go through the school year, what worked, what did not work, what we see as upcoming technology that we'd like to implement in the district, um, policies that didn't work and or did work so that we can always have a working document something that my team can also have goals towards. Because when you look at a technology department, bottom line is the goal is everybody wants their technology to work, but what they don't understand is that there are a lot of moving pieces behind running a department such as this. So this document outlines um, some important stuff, there's some goals in there. Um, you know, the importance of the rapidly changing tech environment. Um, and now something that's big is you know, the role of AI, artificial intelligence. Um, so when you read through this, um, we have some key, I don't want to say, parts of the plan, which would be rapid technological advancements, flexibility, and adaptability. The one thing that I've learned in this department and in this district is we have to be able to pivot. I think the whole senior staff can say that. We're, we're very good at pivoting. Uh, our old plans were not. They locked us into a five-year highway, and if you look back at our last plan, the highway was there, but we missed exits because we were behind. Mm -hmm. um, the last four years with COVID and extra ESSER funding, we've been able to come into our century. Now we want to go that far beyond. Um, changing education needs, um, budgetary constraints. I have to now develop an end-of-life plan broad Chromebooks because every couple of years we're going to have to replace some of the fleet. Um, implementation challenges, budgetary, staffing challenges, and then one of the big pieces of this plan is going to be stakeholder input. Not just internally within the Fall River Public Schools, but with input from the subtech you know, committee, from the school committee, from parents, teachers alike. We want technology is driving life as we know it. We want the input to be from the people that are using it on a daily basis in the classroom and in the schools. Uh, I can read through the goals for you if you'd like and then answer any questions. I did not know how you wanted you know, this to go. Um, I'm looking for it just to be referred as a first read and if there are any <coughs> changes or anything that we would like to discuss you know, more in depth, we could do either at the full committee or here tonight. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so, it sounds like a heavy lift going through all the action steps. Uh, first question is, do you have the appropriate staff to cover all these these action steps? Do you think you are fully staffed to address everything that you have in here? 
So as of right now, at this moment, mm -hmm. I am currently stacked properly in the budget to get the budget. This, this, this work is completed. Okay. Again, we pivot so quickly, I may come back in next budget season and say, I need a security expert to secure our network. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I will be doing that pivoting as well. However, I will try in, in my power to be financially responsible to keep my team intact so that we're not mm -hmm. you know, tasking the budget with extra stack. But as of this moment, we can produce uh, results with the stack. Um, 1.3, the promote digital literacy. You have the action steps, uh, a couple of them. One of them is incorporate digital citizenship lessons into curriculum. Can you give me a little bit? So that? we used to do this before COVID, um, and, and um, it was also part of the Bills program where the kids really just had it as a 20 minute video that they watched about how important it is to be good digital citizens by which you go on social media and you don't bad mouth. So it's a safety. It's, it's a, a safety. It's a safety. Uh, correct. Okay. And then what we would do there was we would piggyback those lessons in the schools to a more, we did a couple of workshops through PACE this year. Um, I'm looking at bringing in um, Mass State Police, um, they have a more in-depth program that they work with the parents on um, that would make your eyes spin, um, but it's something that the parents need to see, and that's more geared towards day-to-day -day internet use and social media uh, use. So that's something that we would um, just to promote in this school year. Now what about the coding and the computer science, because that hasn't really come up on so that is something that instructional. That is something that I'd like to sit again. This is a, a, a rough draft. This is something I'd like to sit down with, um, you know, Mr. Raposo, the new CAO, and with uh, Dr. Curley, so that we can develop some of those. Because if you look at the industry standards now, if you know how to code, if you know how to program, there are kids out there that struggle to do basic. Oh, I'm not industry. disagreeing. With you. I think it's a great idea. I was just wondering as as far as the instructional um, subcommittee and. and and get it the that, program of studies is already out there. So that I anticipate as a rollout to be an afternoon thing. We're going to bring back Tech Tuesdays for staff and students. Okay. Um, so that I anticipate being an after school enrichment to begin. And then once we feel comfortable with how it looks and how that, um, Mr. Farias feels about the program, we actually start to roll it out as a, a force in middle and high. Get some financial literacy, you got me sold. <laughs> Um, got some more, I'm sorry. No um, blah, blah, blah. Also, sure. oh, so, uh, upgrade network and internet connectivity. Uh, ensure all schools have high speed internet access. I didn't know there were schools that did not. So, we, every school does have high speed internet access. And okay. um, we have a dock fiber network throughout the city that we lease through Crown Castle throughout eBay every year. So we pay 20% of that cost, if the 80% is paid by E-rate. However, what we do right now is a building that needs more what's called bandwidth, like the high school, because mm -hmm. of the number of students, they get 10 gigs worth of internet connectivity. While some of our smaller schools, the Watson, get one to two. So what's gonna happen there is, there won't be any infrastructure upgrades as far as wiring in the city, but there'll be some infrastructure upgrades as far as equipment that receives that bandwidth, um, what it's called is a load balancer. We'd be coming to you probably in the next few months to purchase a load balancer so that way when MCAS is in season, I can ship bandwidth where it's needed um, so that there are no hiccups and then ship it back to the okay. schools as well. Okay, establish technology support systems, implement ticketing, ticketing system for reporting and tracking that, that will work. So, where, where are I'm sorry, the uh, established technology support systems, 2.3. The last, yep. uh, the second bullet, sorry. So we have started to implement incident IQ, um, and now we're, we're going to I start to do now is we're going to start to enroll assets into it. So last year, um, student Chromebooks were enrolled mm -hmm. in as assets. So now this year, staff devices are being enrolled as well. Okay. So it is my hope that by mid-year, I can come to you with a report of everything that we have technology in the district and put it in front of you and say, this is our inventory of everything that we own technology. And that's the, I'm talking about the ticketing system. So the ticketing system. But reporting. I thought we had one in place. We do have one in place, but we're expanding on it. Okay. We're gonna now open that asset management piece that we have with it. We 
we started to use it on the student Chromebook side, okay. and we saw how well it worked with that, that I said, I want it, everything that goes around technology access points, I want it all in the same place. So that's what we're working on now. A couple of things. Oh, so the uh, support staff and technology integration. Um, the, the 3FTE instructional technology specialists splitting their time between elementary schools and 1FTE um, in the middle and three for the, the high school level. It, I guess I, my, my question is uh, the amount of students in each. Like, it, is it close, is it comparable for um, elementary schools and the high school? As far as students, so because I know it's about 26 <coughs> and Durfee, 26. So when you look at the instructional tech support model, right. um, the teachers are doing pullouts and PLCs. They were before COVID. Right. They haven't in the past few years. Okay. We're looking to get back to the model where they are more involved in the PLCs. They're more involved in the buildings with student staff. The way it's broken down currently, we are able to cover and give each building their due diligence with the people. Um, there are two buildings, you'll notice on the, um, when we talk about, um, Mr. Aguirre asked for a breakdown of instructional tech staff. We had the Mills program which sunsetted. We lost two of those technicians. Um, buildings decided to use um, those positions to fill a need elsewhere, which I was okay with because we retained two of those positions. So now what will happen is they'll share two buildings each, and then that extra district middle school person will push into both of those. So there'll be a team of three for the middle schools. Okay. So there will be there will be enough. Now again, I do envision at some point and uh, Mr. Farias, the director of instructional tech, um, envision a position down the line sometime if funding is there as a, almost like a professional development specialist that can create these things behind the scenes. Kind of like the Wizard of Oz that's creating right. these professional developments that the instructional techs are then going out there and pushing out and doing because they're out in the building so much we, we mm -hmm. envision seeing that type of position in the future but we're not ready for it yet because the individuals haven't been out in the building doing the work that they did pre-COVID they've been trying to keep ahead of all of the software platforms that we've been using how do we track data on that so all of the stuff uh, all of the software that we use we have what was once called catch on it's now called digital insights. Um, so a listening agent is put on student Chromebooks, and every time a student either uses Lexia, okay. or math, it'll just you know come back to us. At the end of the school year, uh, Mr. Farias and I were having a hiccup with getting the Chromebooks to talk, but we've since gotten the Chromebooks to talk correctly with light speed. So this year, in the initial run, once the Chromebooks are out in the classrooms and the kids are using it, within 30 days, I'll be able to provide a report monthly to the school committee of usage. Thank you. I think I'm good for now. I'm good. Thank you. Mr. Boy, did, <clears throat> I don't know if I misheard this, but did you say that the Verizon people didn't get filled or whatever, and then you were okay with cutting them? No, so um, when the Verizon people came in, they weren't initially part of technology, they were part of the Bills grant. Um, and then when the technology department was built, because we built this technology department under the past superintendent, um, they decided that those people would now report to Mr. Farias. Um, what we did, and I did agree because of the workload and what we saw, two of those positions were transferred to, um, I mean, the superintendent can speak to the need in those two other buildings. However, two of the buildings would like to continue to have someone there. So what we've done is come up with the model of the two will split coverage and we'll have that other middle school person for a total of three in the middle school, which I think is, is pretty suffice in talking with Mr. Farris um, moving forward at the middle school. So we'll talk more about that with the positions, but that doesn't sit well with me personally, because it sounds like as if we had the Verizon and then we just did away with them. You know, almost like we didn't miss a beat, and we had these people. So that begs the question, were we just wasting money on the variety? I'm not saying we were, but it begs the question that if we had, so under your department, we might have had, let's say, 10 people, counting the Verizon people, and now we have eight. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. When did that happen? How much was in the budget? We had this discussion in budget time. Where are the positions? It was like, oh, Verizon's here, Verizon, everybody was like trying to figure it out. 
I'm trying to get it to be more clear. So we said, if you have 10 instructional tech people across that, now the prior superintendent disagreed with me, and the committee, I think, didn't get involved in that. But I still maintain that those positions need to be district positions, not at a school. Because schools use them for different things, and then people transfer. Well, I don't need that. I want to convert that to this. So I convert it to that. But then I'm going to have you or young people go, it's just equity, when I was trying to say, we'll talk more about it. But I did hear you say that you agreed to cut two positions, and I was like, a little shocked. <coughs> Team player. Yeah. The incident IQ that you talked about. Yes. Is that, can you explain what that is, and what, are the, what is the capacity? Because we're paying for software, right? So incident IQ is something that I found at MassQ two years ago that this tool is just phenomenal. It allows us to do a ticketing system with students and staff, parents as well. Um, it also allows us to do inventory on students, staff devices, anything basically. Um, it allows us to create a knowledge base, which is something that we're working on now that we've done the um, minutia pieces of getting devices in. So let's say a teacher constantly comes in every morning and she can't get into her internet. Well, now here's a 30 second video on how to resolve that issue yourself and if you can't, you open up the ticket. Um, it also offers other add-ons which we pay for. We could throw maintenance in there and maintenance could do their ticketing in there. Um, if other departments needed a ticketing system like let's say the cafeteria needed something where there was an event and they needed 300 plates of chicken, we could create a category for cafeteria. Um, the possibilities with that software are endless because it's built off of um, Microsoft technologies that uh, share, it's called SharePoint. Um, so you can build So it's not just a technology, we're only using it for technology. Correct. We could, because we like could three months ago, or actually probably five, six months ago, we sat at a meeting where we were going to do something similar with a, a different company, a maintenance custodial, which is still not implemented to this day. But I'm saying, why do we have so many? It, it just seems like we're redundant, and you have a program that works, and this department has one, so that's the only reason why I ask if it has capacity. It's something, maybe something to streamline, yeah, so we're not paying 30 grand for this, 40 grand for that. And, um, the Durfee Internet, you had mentioned that. I know roughly what you were talking about, but how is it possible that we built that school without having that? top of the line capacity. We do, so Derby has 10 gigs right now. So when you go out to uh, a business internet provider, you're only gonna get 10 gigs in. So then what happens is it depends on what we're using for bandwidth as far as uploads and download speeds. At the high school, we have a 10 gig pipe. At the middle schools, we use between a six and an eight gig pipe, uh, it's called pipe, depending on what the usage is. What I'd like to do, what I had in the former district, it's called a load balancer, and it takes all of the gigs from everywhere and basically one giant bank, and the appliance is smart enough to know Durfee's calling for eight today, they're going to get 8.5. Morton is calling for three, but yesterday they only used one, we're going to give them 2.8. It low But does Durfee need more than 10, is I guess? No, the, absolutely not. So it's not that they're insufficient? It is not that they're insufficient, it's more of a way for us technically to um, move speeds where they're needed for events, MCAS testing, and to spread that campaign yeah. My last question, and thank you for bringing this forward to the committee if you want more changes, anybody else can weigh in. But the long-term, short-term piece, I think I agree with the premise that it's going to be ever-changing, but I'd like to have some sort of piece of it that still talks to the future. So it can be reviewed annually, but also acknowledge for us what's happening. So I know it's budget constraints or whatever, but I think having a a section of it to say future consideration, or whatever the terminology would be, is going to help us to, like, we might say that you cannot do your job in your department without having X amount of tax. It, a place like that is to say in the future that you can't cut that. Or some just to put the future in so it. Almost, and like a, almost like having a staffing slash key projects that we're looking to do that year. Right, because if you look back at the old one, that's where it had all of that. Yeah. And I agree with it. And then we had years of like a, a vacancy, we had none. Mm -hmm. So the year is gonna to help to not have us go dormant yeah. without one, <clears throat> but it'll also give us time to plan. Correct. You know, so <coughs> if we add a section for the full committee, that would make sense. Okay. Motion to refer? Motion to refer. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, so voted. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question about that? Absolutely. Okay. Are, you voting? Uh, are we referring um, as a first meeting for the committee? 
think it's a policy that these things go first rate. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. As just a general rule, but I would research it and if the first read is going to be prohibitive to getting it active before the start of the year, mm -hmm. at the next meeting I would recommend that based on the timing of this, like we can't go to a second read. Okay. If you want to implement it for September, I would just articulate that to us that because of the timing of this meeting, we, you know, if this happened in June, we could have said the July meeting will be first read. If you want it before the start of the year, I think you're going to have to just recommend that we do. We waive the first read and go right to implementation. Okay. We can talk about that. I mean, there might be mm -hmm. committee members who say, I just got it, I need more time. Okay. But, okay, that sure. makes sense. All right, next up is the technology positions. Okay, so um, in having conversations with you, Mr. Aguiar, you know, this is broken down on the instructional technology side because that's where you have you know, the most questions. So um, on that side, department leadership, Mr. Farias leads the department as the director. Um, then when we come into the elementary level, we have the instructional technology uh, specialists, and they're each responsible for a group of schools. And you'll notice um, they all have also either a K-8 or a middle school right now, um, because we have not yet found a candidate for that middle school open position, so they've been helping um, and job sharing with those schools, um, with the Bills, the Bills people as well. Um, Bill's program has now sunset. So now, when that program sunsets, we have two options. <coughs> we sunset, we've signed a document already that said the Chromebooks were ours, we can do whatever we want with them except sell them. Unfortunately for me, those Chromebooks are end of life because we've had them close to six years now, so we've already been in the process of replacing. As you both know, we started to do that last year. Um, the only thing that the, the Chromebooks will not have is uh, Wi-Fi data at home because that program has, has stopped. Um, two of the schools, like we said, decided that they wanted to keep their position as uh, instructional tech. Two did not, um, and we went back and forth on this for a while. Um, and um, just looking at bigger picture for me, I had some discussions with Mr. Farias. Um, I said. We'd be a team player, we'll, we'll let them, those transfer over, and I can remember having the conversation multiple times. Um, so those two positions gone, we'll have three at the middle school level, because you'll have the two that remain, and the one that's open, so we'll have three to be able to go across the middle schools, which I believe is more than suffice. And then at the high school level, we currently have two individuals there full time, um, and we have one open position. Um, they are all posted on the website. I will say, um, after speaking with you, Mr. Aguia, I did notice that the high school position had not been posted yet, but that was just due to the fact of the transition um, between executive directors and the HR department. Uh, it has since been posted, and I actually did receive um, an application um, this afternoon for it. So as we start to open school, we will be interviewing for those positions. Mr. Farias will put together an interview committee um, of six individuals, principals, a broad spectrum of people, one current um, instructional technology person, and then we will do the model that we have as senior staff at central office. Um, then I will meet with the two finalists and um, myself and Mr. Farias will make the final decision on who we bring aboard to um, further strengthen that team. Would you say so, yes? Uh, you have one, one applicant right now? And I have one just applicant. Came, you just yes. posted this just week. Just posted this week. week. Um, and I can tell you the middle school one has been open for quite some time. And it just, we had one individual that I, I really fell in love with. And they just did not want to take it because they could get paid more elsewhere. And they went and they actually decided to not take that job. And now they're uh, an active executive board member for Massachusetts. Um, so they jumped right over that position and went for it. Oh, it's just the it's um, the Massachusetts Consortium of Geeks. <laughs> for the future, I don't think we need to know about the person why it's empty. We can just you can just tell us it's an open position. I'm good. So on that particular issue, the. Positions as they were going, that the high school one. So this one position is open through the non renewable. But how did they get the job in the first place? And I'm not looking for you to say it here, but I think that begs a question for our, 
how did the person get the job? Now, I happen to know a little bit about the background, mm -hmm. so I would just do a little bit of digging yourself to figure out how did that happen so that we're not creating um, like these new positions, right? We're going to hire somebody and the certification requires X, Y, and Z. That person should get X, Y, and Z. Not because somebody, hey, that guy's a good guy, I want to give him a, and I'm not criticizing you, or you were part of it, and I don't even think you were part of that. But the thing is, is if, if we're going to say these positions require a certain license, we need to follow that for every person so that if it's a waiverable thing, you know, just, I think there's more to that issue than what is here. The, I said it before about the two DeVilles and that, if you could please go back and try to make heads or tails of what we had, how many we had, and how many we even currently have in the budget. Because I don't believe at that budget time it was clear whether the positions were in the budget, not in the budget, and maybe you know, maybe you don't know. I mean, I will say generally speaking, um, positions were converted, um, bills positions were converted. And, we, you know, they they do still show up as bills positions, but they're not bills. They are. All of the public schools, there used to be um, a cost share for the salaries in there that no longer exists. And in assuming the full salary for those positions, we did convert some of them to um, an ESL teacher at a school and so on and so on. And so that became, um, you know, that became a mechanism for, for you know, staying within budget, but converting. Um, yeah, for I can just look at, it, just try to trace it back. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I will say, uh, in, in sitting with Dr. Curley and, and Mr. Almeida, um, they did say, like, if this is going to affect day-to-day -day business in tech, we'll sit down and we'll find money if we need those techs. And I was adamant that right now, currently, the way we're set up, we are set to, you know, successful. Right, but the, but the problem is, is, and I don't know if you're going to get the, the data, but when you're at, if you have three schools and three middle schools, and one says, I want to take my village person and convert it to something else, they therefore don't have to ask for that other position because they're converting. It's almost like... Yeah, I do want to clarify, and I don't mean to cut you off, but those conversions were not necessarily within the same school. We had to convert it to middle school, Bills, I think, to an elementary ESL teacher. We did treat those positions as if they were district positions, even though they were housed in individual schools by design. Um, we did treat them as district positions, and when, when conversions were made, they did, in some cases, move to other schools. Yeah, states. and the other flip side of that is the one that said they want to keep it. That didn't convert either. So that we, didn't convert that, but that also, whatever that pot, pot of money is now stayed there, it didn't. You know, so I just trying to get it equal for everybody. So if we have, well, I also asked that the budget in, in the prior meetings here, we talked about the org chart, which you gave a detailed org chart, that these positions all need to go under you, slash Mr. Farias, you know, so that they're in the right thing. They're not part of the, that school, so we get out of the, the thing we're talking about. And you know where I started the year with 10, next year I got 10, I'm even money if I, it'll help us, so. Uh, I don't know if this is just information on my thing for it. So we'll move on to the next uh, item, district website. Okay, so this is something that um, I've been looking at for the last two years. Um, I'm a parent of three. I have one that's in front of me in an eighth grader, and I have two in college. And when I look at fallofthschools.org, while it is full of information, I feel as a parent that it is overwhelming to say the least, and I do this for a living. Um, so what we're looking to do is um, not go out to a different vendor. Um, we're looking to stay with the same vendor because they've been great to us, and their pricing model has not changed in the 10 plus years that, that we've used them. But we're looking to clean up and kind of rebrand forwardtheschools.org. That is gonna be something where we get a bunch of stakeholders around the table, seen one, she's smiling. I know that Dr. Brownhart is going to help lead the charge on that. Uh, Debbie Sardinia, who is uh, our communication specialist, will be working with that as well, as well as uh, Mr. Farris, because he was the original author of forumschools.org mm -hmm. with Final Sight back in the day. Um, and again, we're not, I'm not saying that we're going to take up and just get rid of everything that's there, but there needs to be a more ebb and flow to it. So a parent can go to one area, 
see all the forms that they need to register their child. A, patient, a person can go to one area and all the athletic information is there so that they're not having to dig into a school then that loops back to a dead loop, that loop back to a dead page because it's just so hard to keep up on some of those things so that we can clean this all up and the schools are all structured in the same way whereas when we do a training, if you want to change this cell, this is how you change this cell and give the schools the authority to change certain cells, but the other pieces are the district side, so we can get some continuity across the pages as well, because if you click through the site, there's a lot of stuff that just totally, the continuity is not there. Um, what this also does for us is it will make it easier for any of us to pull up FloridaSchools.org on our cell phone. It'll condense it into a web-based, you know, a phone-looking website. Right now, when you pull up hours, it's very difficult and small. You have to zoom in to get the stuff. This will create the version of the website where you can actually see. It will give you the, you know, the quick, like some elementary schools do. Um, I know Westport was the idea that they cleaned up their website. Uh, Somerset has cleaned up theirs. So that's what we're looking to do. We're looking for ease of use. We're looking for um, continuity. And we're looking to be able to get the word out there, events, parent events, um, events for students. We're looking to become a community, the part of public schools community through the website to share that information. Questions? Yeah, how does, I mean, does Parent Square work at all with, with what will be coming up with this new website? No, so Parent Square is totally different. separate. Okay. And I will say, Dr. Curley will back me up on this, 20 plus years here, that has been one of the best purchases that we have ever made. Right. The product. So, like we're not giving up parents way to put everything on, on the web. Can you talk to me about WEGLA? So WEGLA is something that will actually translate. So in our old website, at the top it will say translate, and that's actually Google Translate. Okay. And Google will do its best with AI to translate it as close as possible. Mm -hmm. WEGLA is an actually AI or foreign languages. Mm -hmm. They have up to 282 in there right now, and it will format it in the page directly as if it was English, Spanish, Portuguese, because a lot of times what will happen is it will shift off the cells, and then somebody that's speaking a different language can't even comprehend what's there because it jumbles all over the place. What Wegblot will do is it will take whatever language, and it will keep it on the page and make it look exactly alike by the click of that button. Right. So I, did I read somewhere that we were only getting five languages? Is that accurate? So we initially discussed five languages, but we that number can be flexible up to 20 in the, in the pricing plan. Um, I have to sit down with Cindy Kudo at Pace. And so see we what, can okay, that was my question. Yes. Yes. Wait, who's yes. going to? We thought of five right off the bat, um, and they were very good because we've been using them for so long. They said, listen, we mm -hmm. can do up to 20, 25. We just need a list. So that's what cost them. There would be no cost at that point. It doesn't matter how many languages that we can. Correct. Okay. <coughs> I think it's time. I think we've been talking about this for for quite a while. I think we've been talking about fixing our website. Um, and, and just to give you um, apples to oranges, um, the former superintendent and I, over the last six months, have been looking at some other companies mm -hmm. to come in and just do it themselves, like mm -hmm. the city did. We're looking at sixty-eight thousand dollars for right. you know, fees. This is. The 16194 is what we would pay this year to renew FloridaSchools.org, whether or not we were going to rebrand and clean it up at all. The 12750 is what we're going to pay um, to get their engineers to clean up. Um, Mrs. Sardini will be taking all the pictures um, because we have her in-house. Um, she will um, take over the reins as mm -hmm. updating day-to-day. -day. Um, virtual webmaster hours, I'm confused on that. So, so what happens there is it's part of every contract. Let's say um, Dr. Curley says, Scott, we need to put up a no school announcement. So I get in there and I put up a no school announcement, but it freezes the page. So it freezes the page to the point where no one is going to see that there's no school. Mm -hmm. So the virtual webmaster is something, it's almost like a tech support where I have a, a, a lifeline that I can call and say, and we don't have this now. We, do we don't have this now. Current now. Now currently, if I have a problem, I have to put in the ticket and then they'll give us basically an estimate of how much it's going to cost to fix whatever is broken. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been doing that on our own. So explain to me about the blocks of 20 hours though. What, what, is, so that, what does that mean? So that means I can, hours? So I can buy it in blocks. So instead of spending $25,000 for the year, I don't know that I'm going to need that. We may not need anything, 
I can buy blocks of 12 hours. So for the start of the project, for the first few we'll months, I'm going to yeah. buy a block of 12 hours just okay. to get us through to learn the new system. But then after that, we're in software all the time, and we'll be comfortable with it. I won't buy the block of hours. I'll just have that regular tech support okay. that I would use with any other product. Okay, I understand. Thank you. No. I yield. So the, uh, you were mentioning about the current, I, I do think we need to upgrade it, but who is responsible for now, right now, updating things on their site, if it's the school so or the, the school, department? Who, who is School and departments have someone that is the authorized user to update their spaces. We, I can provide you a list. Uh, they've been trained um, last year, Mrs. Sardinia went out and trained. Um, and then Debbie and myself and Mr. Vargas have been taking um, turns just because there have been quite a few projects going on, uh, updating the district side of things. Um, what this rebrand will do, it'll make it a lot easier so that uh, Mrs. Sardine will be able to take care of that all on her own because this does the workflow where it will remind her to take post number one down because Dr. B's event is over, make sure we apply to post number two. Um, it's also going to allow us it will allow us to take that parent square same <coughs> post and then put it on the page. It'll allow us to connect in our social media. The one big thing that I really liked about it is if Mrs. Sardinia puts a, um, a post on FloridaSchools.org, it's automatically going to send it to our social media accounts real time. Right now we don't have that. We had it at one point, um, but the cost got a little high, um, so we stopped using it. Um, but that'll help streamline our information across the board. So if you, if I went to the site, and we shouldn't see outdated things on school sites or department sites, if the person in the department has been trained to take it off. Correct. But we see it considered consistently over and over and over. And, and there have been memos that have gone out over and over and over, and what we've tried to do, um, Dr. Curley's really good at it, because I think we sit there and look at the site the most, she'll email me and say, hey, found something, can we fix this? We fix it right away. Um, I need people to buy in that are out there doing this because this is their information. Um, and we also have to come up with a better uh, standard operating procedure internally that if a staff member leaves and it's a principal, there's some type of notification so that something, somebody can go in there and update that information. Um, we have been better at it. I do anticipate with the new executive director of HR that we will have better SOPs and procedures for that. Um, it will make life easier and it will it's our goal to make sure that we're 100% updated all the time. Right now, I would say there are probably still pockets on that current site that could use a good update. Yeah, and then the communication specialist that you mentioned <coughs> in the job description, doesn't it say something about managing the website or something? It does, and, and she currently does. Yeah, she, she lives inside the final site uh, portal right now. Uh, she also goes out, takes pictures of events, she does all the social media posts, um, something that I'm thrilled about is she has been doing more with the press releases um, because that's her background. Um, not only that, she is just a team player. Um, she's great to have with us at the senior leadership. She's been able to help many people. She does translations for us in Portuguese and Spanish if needed. Um, but we see her role this first year as more of a, a learning, how are we gonna make this position fit into the grand picture? And now we know where she's gonna be and it's going to be between Parent Square and the website and, and being out there getting the information. I just raise it because I remember when we voted for the position, the website was a, keeping it updated yeah. website was one of the most important things. And then when we hear, we still don't have an updated website, so we've got to do this and spend more money, it just begs the question of... The spending the more money is not because of the updated website. The spending the more money is because we want to streamline what it looks like. We want to make it easier. No, I get it. But at the end of the day, we all admit that it's still not Correct. updated. Correct. And that's mm -hmm. part of my frustration is that we paid for a position that was going to make sure this stuff was updated. Now, if you're telling me that she or you tell directors and principals need to update the website and it doesn't happen, that's a management issue. So, not looking to get into it, just the point is that we shouldn't have it on not an updated website, period. That includes us. I've mentioned it over and over. Our own site school committee isn't functional. For the right, it's, it's confusing. Things aren't lined up properly. It shouldn't happen. It, so I'm all in favor of it. Just know that it, it's we would. It, it was, you brought it to us to say we're going to get this position. We're going to fix it. 
It's not fixed. And, and just as a counter, not sure. to, to be a dead horse, um, when you look at the school committee page, they what they call a theme, the theme that we're using right now on final site only allows certain places to put that information. So that's why some of the stuff looks a little bit different on the sites because the theme only allows the mayor's picture to be in that <coughs> site and, and Beanie's picture to be there. This will allow us to crop and edit every picture in the same size. It'll make it a 2024 website. While you're on that site, go to the meetings and the minutes and try to tell me what kind of organization they're in. You don't need to answer, I already know. Just, that's what I'm talking about. When you go to the thing, if you're a member of the community, me and myself, anybody, and you go to all of our minutes, it should say chronologically, the top one is the most recent, and it should go right down. The same thing, that's the kind of things I'm talking about, which is probably more a person naming the things in a certain way so that it's organized. And if, and if I may, just, just quickly, um, and I just did it real quickly, what it does is it brings us to our district Google Drive, and um, something that I can do, and maybe this is on me that I, I have trained our users, but um, you can click on name of the file, last modified, um, and then also on the top, you can click on last, you know, last put in file. So um, I can I can work on cleaning that up, but there is a way for it to be. Put those directions together so a member of the public that looks yeah, at it. I will. I was just kidding, because that they shouldn't have to. A member of the public shouldn't say, go to the thing, saw it, and they like, when a member of the public clicks on a button on a website that says go to the minutes of the meeting, they shouldn't have to click anything else other than see the most recent meeting right below. They shouldn't have to click Google Doc. They don't know what a Google Drive is. They don't, but you should be able to see it is my point. And I think that's more of a logistical thing that we can control separate from this proposal. Okay. Um, and, and so maybe Scott, I think setting this up so that it looks more like the, um, the actual meeting minutes uh, agendas. Mm -hmm. You can click on any meeting in the agenda. General. It might make sense, to, again, assuming the template allows it, to put the minutes when they come in as the third piece of information assigned to that particular meeting. Okay. So you've got the date and then it's just the agenda. Okay. You know, okay. So, uh, motion to refer? Yes. Motion to refer. Second. Uh, yeah. District website. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So voted. The only thing I would ask is that when we go to the full committee, if you have Mr. Farris present for the website discussion, in case anyone has questions for him, I would recommend he be there. Okay. And maybe be prepared to uh, have somebody uh, on the screen, you know, if there's questions about what does it look like, it might make more sense for you to say, see how this looks, so that we can say, this is how we want to fix it. Okay. There's something like that. Okay. So. And the last item, the shortest item on the agenda, 304, discussion and vote to approve this public school cell phone free policy, 3.05. Thanks. You're up. <clears throat> it's not the shortest, but we will move it along. All right, sounds good. Um, I'm going to bring it up there, Dr. B. Yeah. Scott, do you want to just control the thing? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Um, I want to start off just by thanking the secondary team here in the district. Um, I, I also want to start off by noting that this project has not been a quick project. We have been working on this project as a district leadership team. I have taken the lead on this work and pondering with um, the secondary principals, so Dr. J, uh, Dr. Jessica Stevens, the now principal of Durfee High School, came to me in late April really looking for some help and support as it relates to the distraction that cell phones play in our school communities, but also the negative influence that cell phones have across our school communities, and we'll get into that throughout the presentation. Um, in addition to that, in speaking with our middle school principals, when we began to explore the opportunity, we really felt that this was an opportunity for all of us as a community to come together and address the impact that cell phones are having um, across a three-pronged tier, right? Looking at the mental health and the implications on, across our students' mental health, their academic performance, and student behavior, all through the influence of cell phones across our school. In addition, I just want to note um, Mr. Drew Woodward, who is our Director of Counseling, along with Victoria Amaral, who is our SEL Integration Specialist. They were central in helping me uh, put together and really, you know, culminate all the data that we were able to collect to design this presentation and create a thoughtful presentation to really justify our request here. 
So we're going to start by looking at the national challenge that I don't think is new to anybody. Um, a three-year longitudinal study conducted among adolescents found that using cell phones to be a significant predictor of depression in emerging young adults. It's important to recognize that nomophobia is a thing and it is the anxiety surrounding cell phone use. It can increase due to negative feedback, cyberbullying, awareness of others, stressful events, and pressure to maintain social network updates. Cell phone addiction can be equated to substance addiction, and this is all a fact that has been proven across a number of different studies over the course of the last 10 to 20 years. When we look at academic behaviors, Standardized test scores have a potential to increase from 6 to 14 percent when phones are banned from classrooms. 92 percent of students studied admitted that they used cell phones during class to text and even admitted to using cell phones to cheat in schools. Yonder's case study in California found that students earned 30 percent more credits when cell phones were banned from schools. It's important to note that there are, you know, this is not a new trend. There are schools across the country. Um, that have begun to ban schools, to ban cell phones in schools, either at a state level, a district level, or a school level. So there's a ton of research out there to show these trends. As we look at online bullying, in a study of cyberbullying, it was found that cell phones can be considered potentially a, a potentially offensive weapon. In, in a biennial support, uh, survey in 2021, the CDC found that 15% of students reported being bullied on school property, 15.9 reported electronic bullying, and 22% reported bullying during 12 months before the survey. And we all know that bullying plays a, plays a role in, in all of our schools. We are actively addressing it and working with our students and staff, but this is an issue that does impact our students. But now let's look at Fall River, because I think that's the most important piece. We recognize the national challenge, but let's look at Fall River. I'd like to note that this year, um, as part of our annual bullying prevention plan, we had to conduct the bullying needs assessment across all of our schools. And in pulling out some of the needs assessment implications, particularly at the middle school level, we are looking at 60% of the student population, first of all, 60% of our students were surveyed in March. So this started back in March. And as we were digging into some of the data, we noticed that of the sixth grade, six through 12 students, 61%, excuse me, of the 6 through 12 students, 61.5 state that the students are often bullied in their school. Highest responses were noted in middle school and among our 9th and 10th grade students. And this is relative to the Fall River survey. And our students' direct response, and it was an anonymous survey, so we do not know who these responses are connected to, but thought that that was important. In addition to that, when we looked at key data from the 6 through 12 students, 3,445 total students were surveyed. 38.42 report that bullying occurs online. 35.41 report that bullying occurs via text. 28.82 state that online bullying spills over into school. 22.3 state that students send inappropriate pictures of others or themselves via social media and text. And all of these numbers are trending above the state averages in all categories. As we look at our academic implications, and we know this is not the only impact on academics, however, 34 fewer students in our ELA 10th grade MCAS are meeting expectations for MCAS achievement compared to the state average. As we continue to just pull um, additional data, 48% fewer students are meeting expectations for MCAS ELA achievement in, with our 8th graders. As we continue to explore, to look at our current conduct implications, there were 1,500 cell phone related infractions in 23-24 across all of our schools and predominantly in the secondary schools. I think it's also important to know as I get into the other pieces of data is that our incident codes as it relates to electronic violation and, and how vice principals are coding incidences has really been all over the place. So it was very difficult for us to be able to just go in and look at cell phone violations. We had to look at a number of different codes, and I'll get into that in a later slide, of how they were coded, in addition to having to look at the descriptions that teachers and vice principals used when writing up what exactly was going on between and among students. So as we look at the 60 incidents of physical altercations and physical aggression, 
that was very much connected to physical altercation and physical aggression, and cell phone was in the description of that incident. As we look at other incidences, five incidences of significant electronic threats, five of electronic theft, and two of sexual harassment, we're just providing the data that we currently have available. Simultaneously, we are working with Brian Michael Azek in Aspen, now that we're back in Aspen this year, um, to really clean up our incident codes. We've spent a significant amount of time this week with our administrators taking feedback around what incident codes do they need access to to ensure that we are able to really code at a granular level the things that are happening in our schools so that our reporting out ability can be more in depth. Um, so while these are what we can report on, we all as a secondary community voiced it even yesterday that we believe that there are higher numbers that we would be able to report out in a future years simply just because our codes are going to be cleaned up for reporting purposes. At the end of the day, 1,500 cell phone incidences in a school year is a lot and we know the manpower that that takes across all of our support staff to respond to that. We also um, took some time to collect stakeholder feedback because we know this is not something that just school administrators can take on. Um, we started with our staff because we needed to be able to survey our staff. There were 451 staff members who responded, again, in an anonymous survey across grades 6 through 12 here in Fall River. Okay, just one question. Yep. All staff members or classroom staff members? Teachers. 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 Thank you for clarifying. So teachers. 88% of staff, teachers, report that students use their cell phones sometimes or always during class time. 95.5% report that phone usage negatively affects learning and engagement. And 98% of staff surveyed and responded would support a phone-free school. We also surveyed parents. And through our parent cell phone survey, we received 692 parent responses, and we were very, very happy with that feedback. Uh, keeping in mind, that was individual parent responses, and some parents have students at multiple schools. So we could have families that have middle school students and high school students taking that into consideration with the total number. Set of those parents who responded, 72.9 of parents would support a phone-free school. 69.1 agree that a phone-free classroom would boost learning. And 51% report that their students have been cyberbullied through cell phone usage. Over the summer, we also took an opportunity to conduct focus groups with students. So our surveying really took us through early, uh, early June as we started to um, collect all of this data. And we didn't feel that was a good time for us to try to start holding focus groups as kids were already kind of putting themselves on the beach and preparing for summer work. Um, so we took some time with our students in summer school. And we thought that was a really great use of time to meet with our students who are currently sitting in summer school classes. Um, at the secondary level, we met with 100 students across the secondary schools. The key feedback from our middle school students, and I must say, we were overwhelmingly impressed with the self-awareness that our middle school students were able to convey. Um, some of the quotes specifically, you would perform better academically because you would work better and not get distracted by your phone. Um, students made comments, my friends and I would be closer. Uh, some other comments that were made, some students have phones for reasons and some just for fun. It can be negative because of cyberbullying. Other quotes, it would be because kids would not have to worry about social media or who is texting them. They would be able to focus on their work instead of what's going on on social. As we looked at our students in high school, including our young adult program, the special education young adult program, um, students commented, this year I failed every class except for history, and that was the one class where I was not allowed to use my phone. I wouldn't look forward to it at all, but my teacher made sure I always had my phone away. It would be good to have a phone-free school because then you'll learn different things. The phones don't, go, don't do any good. They don't teach you how to do math. It would distract you from learning. Other comments, I don't use my phone much. I wait until I'm done with my schoolwork. It motivates me to get my schoolwork done so that I can use my phone, which is some of our student feedback. Um, some other feedback from our high school students as well. Um, some students were resistant to the idea of being without their phone, and we would expect that. We, we are anticipating that. 
Um, some st students are worried about communication and safety protocols during an evacuation or an emergency situation. And I would say that is not a concern <coughs> that we too would not be concerned about and also came up across families and some of the family concerns that did were arisen. Um, and then many students, some students commented about inconsistent implementation as a challenge um, based on previous enforcement in schools. And so we'll talk about um, even some pieces that we looked at as that goes. And many students were concerned about communication with their parents for after school transportation and child care. So as we look at what is the current cell phone policy and protocol, um, there is no uniform cell phone policy across the four of the public schools. Um, student cell phone use is currently not in the code of conduct um, as a section that lives as a policy. Secondary schools are currently interpreting the existing technology policy to serve the needs of their student population and discipline structures. So it's more through the lens of po uh, protocols, not in a set policy. During last year, as I looked um, to take a deeper look at students who had multiple violations of cell phone use and how our vice principals and principals awarding discipline to those students or interventions to those students to curb the behavior, and we saw a wide range of how it was being handled. Um, initially, as I noted earlier, the incident codes range with rules violation, disorderly conduct, disrespect, and electronics violation. Um, and when we look at how the actions or interventions were assigned, it was very inconsistent with um, conference with admin, detention, restorative justice, parent conference by phone, and in a few instances we did see out-of-school suspension. We are looking to create a cohesive movement towards a phone-free school that also includes consistent incident coding in addition to a discipline matrix that will be embedded in our, project, our draft policy so that the way that we respond to cell phone incidences is consistent across all levels. Which leads us to that we are creating the discipline matrix to be inclusive of, I just I think it's important to note that we are right now with a draft of a discipline matrix that is inclusive of all incident codes in the district, not just cell phones, but inclusive of cell phones at the same time. And so as we think about how do we accomplish this, the Yonder program has been around for a number of years, and you know I think it's, it definitely started for concerts and different events where professionals did not want adults videotaping and then putting online the presentations and the events. I think many of us might have been to concerts or comedy shows, and when you walk in, they take your phone and you've got to put it in the Yonder pouch. Um, well, school districts have also begun to adopt this and we'd like to take a look at this as an opportunity. So Yonder program is a complete phone-free solution that proactively addresses phone-related challenges and improves students' focus, social connection, and academic performance. So the idea is that students, to the far left of the slide, students receive their own Yonder pouch. It's a personalized pouch, the same way that we did with the Verizon Chromebooks, where students will have their own pouch. When they walk in the door in the morning, they will be expected to put their phone in the pouch in front of adults that will be welcoming students to school as we already typically have as protocol. Students will need to secure their pouch, keep it secured throughout the course of the school day, and as students exit the school at the end of the day, the magnets which are used to open up the, ma the, the magnet, which is what closes the pouch, there are magnets for kids as they exit school that they are able to hit their pouch up against the magnet it opens the pouch and students are able to then go off and function outside of school with their cell phone so that is the yonder pouch and that is the functionability of the yonder pouch yonder as i noted has already been in schools and so they have data that speaks to the behavioral outcomes and student outcomes in a specific case study in philadelphia as we look at the positive social interaction, the implementation of Yonder increased positive social action, uh, social interaction, excuse me, among students from um, by 78.6% affirmatively noted. As we look at minimizing disruption in schools, 100% of schools involved recognize a decrease in student behavioral infractions as a result. Learning and engagement reported out um, that Yonder reduced distractions to student learning and engagement through this implementation. The impact on academic outcomes. 
65% of participating Yonder schools across 21 countries saw an increase in academic performance. And you can see down below, they also begin working with students as early as sixth grade and then support students through high school, as we can see the bar trends that, that show that difference. The previous year is the dark, and the yellow is with one year of Yonder in implementation in those schools. And notably, students preparing to make the transition to college and career and life are seeing the greatest impact on their overall academic success. We thought it would be important to highlight the school districts um, both in the United, uh, in Massachusetts, but also across the country who are embarking upon cell phone free school policies. Um, anyone who has linked to this, and we will post this online, the blue highlights are links into those cell phone policies that support this plan. Um, most notably of our neighboring communities, the Brockton Public Schools will be engaging in Yonder coming this September, and the Newman Public Schools have already been engaging in Yonder um, previously. And in some cases, states have begun to put cell phone free schools into state law, and you'll notice that Ohio, Indiana, and Oklahoma currently are leading the charge on that. And so as we think of the potential challenges, you know, we have talked about this ad nauseum at the, at, the, um, at the administrator level, both this week and periodically across our planning session. As a matter of fact, before we even seriously entertained this conversation, we held a virtual meeting with all support staff at our secondary schools, vice principals and principals, because I was not going to put the legwork into this initiative if staff did not understand the role that they were going to play as it relates to supporting students and supporting teachers in the implementation of this policy and protocol. So upholding policy consistently is at the forefront of all of our school level designing as we think about the operational planning and the implementation planning. Consistency, consistency, consistency. The word consistency and consistently came up over 300 times in the teacher feedback survey and it was a predominant statement in the parent feedback. And if you click into the links to those survey outcomes that I clicked into here as well, you'll be able to see those outcomes as well. We recognize that there will be resistance from students and parents and guardians. We recognize that this will be a challenge and we are planning um, you know, with a school committee approval to begin going on a marketing tour, um, having forums at schools, engaging with families who we know have identified um, they, are, they are not in favor of this so that we can hold small group forums at schools and have principals run town meetings at their schools to really be able to answer the questions of our families. <clears throat> the impact on emergency communication, um, I, you know, Director of um, Security is also here, John Ventura, he has been central, I should have noted that early, John has been really central in connecting with other school districts and speaking with other school districts as it relates. Um, I will go back to being very you know, optimistic around the use of Parent Square, which also came up in our parent survey. Parent Square is a widely utilized tool. We continue to use that tool for all levels of communication, whether it's emergency communication or general two-way communication. Um, and when we really think about the true emergency situations that most of us would be most concerned, we have to agree that cell phones and kids having access to cell phones very likely could create more of a disturbance in a tier three emergency situation than actually help in, in those instances. Um, however, we will continue to address those concerns as we continue to move forward in our stakeholder engagement sessions. As we look at cell phone withdrawal and nomophobia, we recognize that that is, a, that, that is an anxiety and that is a diagnosis. And so how our support staff how our partnerships like Cartwheel that we have already partnered with to provide counseling and therapeutic supports for kids who are truly exhibiting those behaviors as it relates to cell phones. I would also say, um, as, a, as a school counselor myself and in working in the district in this capacity this past year, if we have students that are this um, addicted to cell phones, I am more concerned about a larger addictive personality and how are we supporting our kids to overcome um, those tendencies alongside partnering with their families and the resources we know we have available to us. Securing cell phones from student attempts to disabling and locking them. We recognize hacking is a thing um, and we recognize our kids are waking up every day smarter and quicker at these things than we are. However, I do believe this is where the education around the why comes into play. Um, explaining to our students and explaining the why behind this initiative 
and really, you know, supporting students and reflecting on their own cell phone usage and their own interactions with cell phone usage in school and how positive and negative impacts that it does have on them as, as learners and as young adults. So we will continue to work with our students and certainly I think it also just needs to be stated that for students who continue to refuse to comply, that is also the reason that we have the discipline matrix built into the policy. Because at some point we have to be on the same page that if we agree that it's a non-negotiable, then this is a non-negotiable policy for us as a forum public schools community. And so then I leave and I end the last statement with, you know, for me it's also about we need school committee support for this. There cannot, and we need district leadership support to be supporting principals. When parents call complaining, when constituents call complaining, we need school committee to have our back. We need school committee to recognize where we're coming from. We, when we're, if we're talking about inconsistency of the implementation of the policy, then that is truly where evaluation and supervision comes into play. Because everybody has a stake in this game. Everybody has a role to play. The same way that we're going to need our teachers involved in this, and one of the first steps you know, with the school committee approval will be to include the FREA in future planning, because our teachers need to be central in this as well. But there is a role for everybody to play as it relates to the enforcing of this policy, and accountability starts at the top. So we will need the school committee to have our back and to support us, particularly with constituents that get frustrated with the implementation of the policy. And I think it's important to recognize we may see actions along different realms of Saturday school, alternatives to suspension, but for students who are absolutely not complying and refusing to comply, we may have to land in a suspension from school situation. Albeit that would be our absolute last resort, we also need to send the message that if this is what we are moving forward with as a committee and as a community, that that is where we are headed as a community and as a school, full enforcement. The same way that we have done with our high quality instructional materials. We cannot stray and we cannot waver. And supporting one another in that work will be central. I think it's also important to note um, through Yonder there are special circumstances. Um, so emergency evacuation, which is not including in drills, mobile magnets would be deployed so that students are able to unlock in those drills, practicing for a real drill, right? Um, when we look at students who have medical needs or for whatever reason their cell phone is written into their IEP or 504 plan, they do have medical yonder pouches that do not have the magnet, but the pouches have a Velcro strip. So students will be expected to use their phones only for the purpose that they are on a medical exemption or an exemption, um, and then otherwise students would be held accountable to the same discipline matrix as it relates to the different just to the use of cell phone outside of those exemption reasons. When we think about our students who use their cell phones for translation tools, I have already been in communication with Frank Farias um, as it relates to the tools that are available in our Chromebooks and how we can leverage the tools available through apps and other mediums that are available through the Chromebook that we would not be required to have students having cell phones. And we have also begun to purchase the Pocket Talk device here in the district. We are rolling that out with our adults to start, but if we believe that that device could serve as a tool in some of our classrooms, we would then look to potentially purchase those devices for those classrooms when the need is shown to be um, present. So we've looked at Yonder and we are currently updating enrollment trends because obviously, you know, we, as of last year, um, we got a particular number based on the number of students we were serving. I have asked most recently to get updated numbers based on students who've left the district and our new registers just so that I can have um, the most up-to-date number. We have talked with um, Mr. Almeida, our CFO, and we are able to pay for Yonder out of um, expiring ESSER, ESSER funds the end of September. Um, and so as of right now, the proposal, if you clicked on here, it would be $130,000 to launch the year one. And I am working with the gentleman from Yonder to get the best price possible in partnership with Frank Farias and Brian Michaelazak so we can make sure we get the best price possible for the one to two year plan because there will be a replacement fee going into year two for broken pouches, um, but the pouches recycle. So it's not this idea where everything goes away and we start fresh every year. We would be recycling pouches and only replacing pouches in the same way that we did the Verizon program as a point of reference. Keeping in mind too, I think it's important to note that we want to just clear up the schools. We are looking at Durfee High School, Morton Middle School, Cuss Middle School, 
Talbot Middle School, along with our two community schools, Henry Lord and Doran. In speaking with Principal Shaw at Stone, they already have a take at the door cell phone policy that has been successful for Stone, so they did not feel that they needed to deviate from this plan. Similarly, in speaking with Principal Riley at RPA, they too already take cell phones at the door, so we would be cell phone free grades 6 through 12, but our Stone and Resiliency Preparatory School would not be involved in this program because of the other modes of taking cell phones they already have in place. And they felt comfortable with sticking with that. And so then we just roll into what is currently you know, in motion and in process, pending school committee approval. We're looking at a communication for rollout at the district level, uh, beginning with staff, communicating with parents and students, creating videos, leveraging the website, leveraging Parent Square, setting up info sessions at the north end, at the south end, and then supporting schools with their own information sessions at every school site, um, both prior to the start of the school year and then as school opens. Because uh, one thing you'll notice at the very bottom of this slide, we are not proposing to start this the very first day of school. After speaking with um, Yonder and meeting as a school um, of leaders, a, a representative of school leaders yesterday, we really discussed the need to get this right. We also want to be certain that we have as many students enrolled and really in their routines before we come in with Yonder. We also believe it gives us an opportunity to ensure that every single student hears the message prior to rollout. Every single student will have the opportunity um, to meet with counselors and, and navigate the cell phone policy prior to rollout. And then we will have an opportunity for a full distribution prior to the rollout day. Um, and so we believe, you know, we're looking at Monday, September 16th or Monday, September 23rd. And that will all really lay out once we take a look at what schools implementation plans entail and how we can be the most productive to be as supportive and proactive and inclusive in the next give or take month um, pending school committee approval though August 12th. And then the next slide speaks to the work that currently the principals and building based teams are doing at the school level as it relates to reviewing our cell phone policy, giving us feedback to make sure that it was all inclusive, a distribution plan, a staff outreach plan, an operational plan, student info sessions, parent info sessions, and communication. And then the rest is just um, references and links to the research that we referenced um, and it's just sort of citing um, where our information came from. In addition, um, so I guess first I, I should just, I'll, just one more piece. I also put in the um, folder for you a draft policy. Um, and so this includes the purpose, the policy statement, <clears throat> procedures as it relates to arriving at school during the school day and the end of the school day, uh, really spells out the exemptions, and then speaks to unmet expectations. Um, so the different scenarios that we can anticipate based on the research that we've done as it relates to um, what, we, what could potentially land a student to be experiencing the discipline matrix and the unmet expectations. And so you'll notice we have a first through sixth offense through a discipline matrix very much spelled out. Um, as well as an emergency protocol that is built in to the policy as well. And then a response to some frequently asked questions that when we were really digging into other websites and other school districts who are already engaging in this work, we wanted to bring up front some of the commonly asked questions that we saw universally across those sites. And so with that, you know, I will yield on the presentation and any questions um, I'd be happy to answer. Also, you know, Dr. Jessica Stevens is here with me, Mr. Ventura is here, and a couple of other principals in the crowd. Yes, well, thank you, Dr. Bronhard. That was uh, very informative. Um, and this school committee member, I just have a couple questions. And it's mostly systems in place. And I'm going to support this 100%. I think we're way overdue. I think a um, few conversations have already happened, but something was said about, you know, we have to stand up and take our schools back and, and understand what's important. And, and the the kids' education is being disruptive. Their social emotional health is being disruptive. Uh, we have to make a move, and I think this is the move. I think this is this is great. But let me. Uh, so the system, mostly at Dorothy Dr. J, 
So I remember a little while back when we were having, you know, some weapons issues and we, we would check it before we got involved, right? So we were checking the backpacks before the kids got into school and it caused quite uh, a burden because there were lines out the door around the block and over <laughs> wherever. But how are we going to, I, I don't know if you've, if it's too early to discuss that, but the system to get these kids their pouches, um, it's not every day, right? That was mentioned, they keep the pouch. So they're paying $26 when they lose it. That's accurate, right? There's gonna be a fee. Um, but is that gonna be done before the 16th? Or like, that's not gonna be done like the day of school. That we're starting to implement, get in line, get your pouch. It's not gonna be a two hour three-hour thing is going to be something in place where we're not disrupting the first day that we're rolling this out. That's my question, basically. So one of the reasons that I think it's going to be beneficial to not start on this first day, which Yonder has completely supported, um, is because not only does the messaging, uh, does that allow for the messaging to be uh, more efficient, more thorough, etc., mm -hmm. but it also allows for those systemic type things to happen in a more practical way. I mean, if everybody's outside lined up for three days on the first day of school waiting for a pouch, that's not going to come to life in a very good way. So we are hopeful that by having that window of time, that short window of time in the beginning of the school year, not only will we be able to message well to students and families that this is coming very soon, but we'll be able to use avenues, you know, potentially like advisory, where most kids have a really strong relationship with that teacher to maybe deliver the pouches, maybe discuss expectations with the pouch, maybe give them an opportunity to decorate or brand or make it theirs, all in a lead up to when this launch day is going to be. And that has been a rollout that Yonder has supported and says is essentially the way that you do it if you want it to be effective. Great. So the, on the first one, it was the emergency evacuate wasn't on there, so I had questions, but the second one did, like yes. if there is an emergency, not everybody's gonna have to go, but that's on the second one. So, um, lose pouch systems. Um, the second, somewhere it says, yeah, what if a student uh, needs their personal device for medical issues? So right off the bat, it comes, uh, type one diabetes comes to, comes to my mind, right? So, um, a lot of these, I don't know how many type one diabetics are at Durfee, you probably know, so I'm, I'm happy to see that, I, I bet that was a topic, because type 1 diabetics need their, their Dexcom and their readings, and they have to be, at, be able to, one, hear their phones and see their phones and have their phones. So as long as that is being addressed um, and the parents um, uh, are comfortable to, speaking to a nurse who is obviously very well versed in T1D, um, I, I think um, I'm going to be okay with that. I, it kind of scared me a little bit until I, I read that. And, so. and I think it's important to know for the medical student, for the medical pouches, mm -hmm. students do not have to go to a magnet to open it. They are able to open the pouch because it's a Velcro script. It's a Velcro. Okay. So if, it, if there is an emergency for a student who has the medical pouch, and I would assume all students that have diabetes or even other diagnoses right. potentially. Right. Um, there will be a form that families will have to fill out. Students will still be held to the same expectation of phone is away and off other than to address the medical situation. But they do have access to their phone to get all of what you are describing. And there was a comment that came up yesterday with one of our vice principals who is a diabetic herself. And the pouch, John, you can speak to this maybe, but the pouch, it reads through the pouch. The pouch is readable through it. And you can hear, and you can hear it. It's mostly the alarming, yes. the alarm that goes off if they that re, uh, uh, reach a certain level of their, you know, glucose. But, okay. Um, I'm going to yield for now and see where the conversation goes. Thank you. Thank you. Somewhere in the presentation, there was a question about music and kids can listen to music. Do we have a policy in the Florida schools about listening to music? Because that's like a big thing, and it, I, it always gets me because you can't be paying, for every reason we just talked about here, it, instructional. You can't be listening to music all day and learning. So it just begs the question of if we're going to go and be a thorough policy, I don't think music should be played unless it's something in a uh, special circumstance with this child with a disability or some other rationale. Just kids saying, I want to listen to music while my teacher's teaching. That's part of the reason why we're in this mess, I think. We 
because they just think they can put the A butts in and not pay attention to anybody else. So that was just something that. So, so the, the pouch is big enough, I mean, right now for the biggest cell phone on the market, plus the Apple Watch and the earplugs. Yeah. Kids who have the big earphones, I mean, the, 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 uh, the headphones, I mean, those won't fit inside. Um, but if they don't have their cell phone, then they shouldn't have their headphones on anyway. So I think it's said in here somewhere they can listen to it in their Chromebook uh, or oh. something like that. So that, in here. How is the translation piece? I don't know. Whatever it is. Yeah, because if you look at number two on the procedures of the policy, it states that students will place their AirPods, earbuds, and smartwatch inside mm -hmm. of the pouch. Right. So it's, a, it's the cell phone, if you have a smartwatch, that talks to that phone, it goes in the pouch, and if you have ear, earbuds, ear pods, so the kids are not connecting to their devices and listening to music sitting in the classroom. I was referring to the second, the frequently asked questions last line. Yep. Will students be able to listen to music? Students will be able to use headphones with cords to connect to their Chromebooks. So that implies to me that the students are listening to music on their, on their uh, headphones, on their Chromebooks. So, well, no, students will be able to use headphones. Oh, it's, it's questioning music. So maybe, maybe we should even rephrase that. What we were also talking about is we may need to purchase some headphones that plug into the tech devices in some classes that they may be having for instructional, right. correct? Not that the music might just make it look. Yes. Uh, that's one thing. I can address that. Yep. The, uh, you had mentioned Stone and RPA having a policy, having a procedure, I procedure. guess, to take it. I think if we're gonna implement this district-wide for this grade level, that needs to be implemented in a policy. That says they are going to at those two schools. The policy is that they're taking it because we don't want to be leaving it open to them to say, "Oh, I, you know, okay. we relax the protocol." Okay. If it's going to be policy, I think they need to meet with the same uh, expectations. Add it to the policy so that they are not exempt should the principal decide to change their mind. Correct. So I'm yeah. Understand. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Plus, it gives us an avenue if a parent has a, a student at here at Cus and at RPA. Why is one different from the other? We'll, we'll have that answer right in the model. So. And I'm assuming maybe they don't have, need it, but sneaking the phone, like when you do the matrix of you hide the phone, putting a, a fake phone in or whatever, and it's going to address it all. They'll be, they'll be treated just like everybody else, Mr. Yeah. Ventura's point. Um, the, I appreciate the, this is a big issue. It's been an issue for a long time. And I appreciate the willingness and honesty of that we haven't necessarily with fidelity been consistent with implementing not only this but all of the various conducts because I for one get calls all the time to say exactly what Mr. Ventura just said. Student at one school did X and got this, student at Y did this, they got that. And they're not even in the same they're in the same grade, it's not or something. So that to me is a big issue across all of the uh, schools. So being honest I think is, is the best way to handle it to say, but we need everybody on board. And I think too many times we've had people turn the other way because they don't want to take the fight and they don't know if the principal is going to back them up and then they don't know if the school committee is going to back them up they don't know if the superintendent is going to back them up so your point of everybody being on the same page I think is important and we we need to know they need to know that there is an end game and we're not playing with this issue that might mean our suspensions are going to go up that might mean a student might drop out of school ultimately because some kids are so stuck on it that they're not doing it if they're failing anyway and the school is like a social call for them, we have to be able to say, we're going to give you all the support you want, but if that's what your decision is, then we're not bending because we feel that, like, I just think we need to be very transparent with the whole committee. So when this, the dropout rate goes up and the Desi wants to criticize us or whatever, we can all back each other up and say, yeah, it might have went up because we are holding the line for the 99% of the kids that are following the rules. So if 1% not following it, there has to be sort of an end game, so. And I, and I just want to say too, you know, I agree with you, and at the same time, you know, that's also why in the next year I, I will be coming back with some alternative options, because I truly believe as a district we need to continue to build the alternative options for kids. Because if we get to a point, I think it's a much bigger concern for me that if we get to a point that a, a student chooses to drop out of school in lieu of turning in a cell phone, I am way more concerned about that student's mental health and what supports that student needs for life if that's the response at that age, right? And if the student is supported in that action at that age. Um, but that being said, you know, I've been working really hard this year with, with the secondary team and I will continue to work hard as if we look at building out alternative options, not just at RPA, but separate from RPA, 
We started having the virtual school conversation. We paused in the spring of this year because we weren't ready to come forward. Since then, there's been some other really great conversations, and, and I look forward to the next week or so because I'm going to continue to explore those conversations. But Mr. Woodward and myself are still moving forward with the virtual school um, so that if a student really can't comply, then maybe the virtual school needs to be their option down the road. So we're not just going to end with that mantra, but recognizing we're going to continue to build other options. But to your point, Mr. Aguiar, we got to hold the line in support of everybody um, and, and navigate those outcomes as they come up. Hopefully we don't get there, and we'll do everything we can to support kids and families to not get there, but we can't make those decisions for folks once they get there as individuals. Yeah, and I think that, that well said, and that we get it, especially at the high school level, at some point, these students can't be dictating what they're going to do for us. We have to dictate that you're here to learn, and we're not playing games. So you're going to have a few cases, I guarantee you, of kids that are going to push that center wall and try to make a point of it or whatever. I, for one, say, I have your back. I'm not backing down. But we all need to say it at the same time so that that kid's parent says, oh, Dr. Stevens took my thing and suspended me. But yeah, well, what happened? And as long as we're consistent, we can, we can I think, get there with at least making the dent in what we have. Uh, the only other thing I would say is the, uh, which I think was this issues about, and you're in charge of both, I think, whether a student at the high school, for instance, has all these issues and we're trying to help them or whatever, and they get to this point, is there a way to just transfer them to another school if that's an option? So separate discussion, but legally, is it our option to be able to say if you don't, and is that maybe something that we put in the matrix to say, you know, we've tried this, we did this, we suspended you, now the next one could be you might have to go to school at a different place um, against their will. You know, sometimes it's always like you have to ask for permission and all that. Um, I just think it, it's going to get there. We've seen, the committee has seen uh, letters, we saw comments from students about how bad that cell phones were at the high school, how disrespectful the kids are to the security guards, to the teachers, to whoever. Like we've, we've seen it all as far as that goes. And so knowing that, I can only imagine how it is to try to do that. So you have my support. I think it's a good program uh, to implement. And let's give it uh, the best shot we can. And if we need change, um, you do need to get this, I think, before the committee for full vote. Oh, but, yeah, that's why. You know what I'm saying? Yes. But not to Dr. Phil's point about this needs to say, we don't do the city council things like emergencies. We just vote it and then we say it's got to be done so we can vote on it. But I would entertain a motion to refer. Oh, refer. One more question. Yeah. Sure. I'll, I'll make motion to refer. A second and a question. Um, it, I don't know if it's a question, but more of a, a suggestion and maybe I hope. But I just don't want to, I'm reading through when I was reading the consequences of unmet. unmet uh, expectations. I just don't want to have these expectations, right, and not be able to follow through with them because of lack of staff. I just would like you to let the committee know if, we're, if we need to add a position, if we need to anything to support that that, that this is going to be successful. I think we we, we just want to be told. I so guess, I, I think a, in a quick response to that, I think launching and having a strong launch is going to be most important. Number one. From there, not having cell phones in our schools is going to change the work of our administrators drastically. Okay. So when we think about our vice principals who had to be the investigators of those 1,000 incidences, how much time that takes from our staff to do other proactive work. So we will come back if we feel the need. I feel right now, based on all the feedback we've received from principals and across the, the network, um, that we are ready and poised with the right staffing and proper staffing. You know, we have not made any cuts as a result of negotiations. I think it's important to state that. So we're going into this with the notion that, you know, we're going full budget based on what we've planned. Um, and staff situation has not come up as a concern with principal. Is there, up. is there, that's good to know, is there uh, currently Saturday school in the middle schools and high school? Mm -hmm. There is. What Thursday school in the high school? Wednesday. Saturday. Wednesday. Wednesday. So the high school has Wednesday. Yeah, we, so currently we have Wednesday school. Um, we've had Saturday school in kind of an inconsistent way, but this year it is going to be 100%. Right. I, I, there's, as a teenager, you know, I, I, I watched a lot of my school when I was at my other job. A lot of the students that went to Diamond, the worst thing ever is Saturday school. And it, it changed a lot of habits. So you put that on there, Saturday school, and I actually 
enjoyed seeing it. And that was the systems in place that was like, I hope this can work, but if you're going to be transitioning to another day. So totally up to you guys. We already have Saturday school in the middle schools. Okay. Dr. J is adding yeah. Saturday school at the yeah. high school, and yeah. we've already had a Wednesday school, um, mainly for transportation purposes, back in the day. I mean, it was, back, it was at Derby when I was there, and that was over eight years ago now, right? Or eight years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and really, the idea is extending the kids' school day because they're already there where we recognize transportation can be challenging on the weekends for kids to get to Durfee from the south right. end and even right. neighboring town, right? So neighboring areas. Can be yeah, and, and you see it, it, it's not, you know, the first, second, or third, or fourth. It's, Thank it's you. later yes. on. Yes. It's, it's okay, you're not getting it. So I, I like you're that idea. You're choosing not You're to choosing get it. not to get it. Right. So it is a, it's, it's a, it's a good consequence in my, in my book. I yield, you made a motion. One, one, um, Question would be, or if you can get us for the full committee, the implementation of how we're going to hand them out, like what daily, mm -hmm. just so we can get a feel for is it the principal is going to hand them out? I'm not saying we're going to, but oh, okay. like whatever that y'all doing, whatever the middle schools are going to do, so we know when we ask the question, like a staff, how are we going to get these things handled, handed out? So, what I would ask if it's okay, um, I can give a full update report, like about a week after the school committee meeting. Um, because schools are now planning for this work, mm -hmm. so I can give a complete plan of all of it. Um, I don't know that I'll have exactly the nitty gritty ready to go for Monday the 12th, um, but we will have the implementation plans and I can share those with you even through I would Friday. I would even say, yeah. just, uh, even if you said that the uh, school administration is going to hand them out, something like that. So that would mean your kind of administrators or whoever, like just to kind of give us a rough idea of who the school based staff is going to be. Okay. I think something like that is totally fine. So on the motion, all in favor, aye, opposed, so voted. Thank you very much. Um, any new business before, to come before us? I don't think so. No? Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion, motion to, to adjourn. adjourn. Second. Yes. All in favor, aye, opposed, so voted. We are adjourned. Thank you all so much.